Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 12 of the Gateway Project, where Joseph Kerman is out there somewhere in the dark, hiding out, building some kind of strange, mysterious device. We have no idea what it is, but I can't imagine it will be anything but bad for the Gateway Project. Well, Anyway, in this episode, we are going to catch up to the events of July 2001, when in our dimension, the Space Shuttle Atlantis, STS-104, brought up the Quest Airlock. We will also fix the error of having ORU-2 and not brought up in the previous episode. Uh-oh, it looks like Joseph has dropped that thing off somewhere, and I don't know where. Well, here we are in our dimension, launching the Quest Airlock, and whoa! I think it just fell out of the fairing, didn't it? I take the rocket down to take a look around and see what's down there, and sure enough, it was laying on the ground. So I simply drop the rocket to the ground, and oh look, the Quest airlock survived. It must have been the orbital injection. Okay, well, we can fix that. We'll go into the vehicle assembly building, and we'll attach some struts on the inside fairing, and then we'll strut that to the orbital injection phase stage, and that should hold it in place, right? So we'll do that and we'll take another try at it. Put some struts down here on the bottom decoupler as well. Add a KW rocketry gyroscope for good measure and off we go. This time it's going to hold. The struts are in place and everything is good. So we're underway. Oh, and there it goes again. All right, so I go down and I take another look. What happened this time? and over goes the rocket. We land that on the ground because we're trying to hold on to that Quest airlock. See, there's no reason. Sure, it's faced a couple crashes, but it's only a dent here, a scratch there. We can launch it again a third time, and once we get that up on the station, no one will know. Well, I think maybe it was the AIES decoupler that I was using, so I switch over to a squad decoupler, and we zoom in, and on this launch, we take a look inside and see whether or not it seems to be shaking loose or about to break in any way. It looks like it's fairly stable. That side's good. Let's take a look at the other side. That side's good. Okay, this rocket is going into orbit. All right, this time we're going to make it. But watch the middle of the fairing. There was a puff of white smoke. What could that have been? Well, the staging was set wrong because when I put that squad decoupler in there instead of the AIES decoupler that I had that kept falling off, uh, I forgot to check the staging to see where it went. And right now it's actually loose up inside the fairing. And as we turn the rocket in the direction, and I actually knew that it probably had something go wrong, but I was hoping that I could just push it up into orbit anyway. But I just couldn't get it to stay inside that fairing. And there it goes. That is our orbital injection stage. So we bring down the quest airlock once again. Oh dear. Oh, now we need a second one. Well, I wasn't able to make it survive through three failures, but we had a backup to the Quest airlock, so that one is on its way up, and this time we are doing it. Okay, so we get our apoapsis up there, we match it to our ascending node, and then we make our little adjustment that will bring us in line with the station. The Quest airlock in our dimension was four meters by five and a half meters. So when I scale that into Kerbin terms, it means I'm going to be using the 2.5 meter for the width, and I need to get it to about three and a third meters tall. And that's exactly what you're seeing right here. I used that little fuel tank, that's the 2.5. That's what the station in our world looked like before and after the Quest airlock was docked. Before that Quest Joint airlock was docked, spacewalks that were using the Russian Orlin spacesuits could only go out through this Vesda module, and the uh, EMUs, which is the extravehicular mobility units of the United States, those could only be, uh, be used when a space shuttle was docked. But after the Quest airlock gets inserted in here, then spacesuits of both types can be used through this one airlock, and this becomes the primary airlock for the entire station. So we'll just transfer a little bit of fuel over into the deorbiting injection stage for the Quest airlock, but we're not actually going to decouple it just yet. There's a little bit of cargo on the outside, so Bob needs to go and take care of that. So though there are four 
compartments and other things that need to be moved, but let's go take a look at it here. Okay, so the Quest Airlock has on it, of course, a launcher, and there's a little uh, extra tug up here to put it into place. We've seen those before. Down here we have several bits of cargo that needed to go up. This was the orbital replacement unit on a little rack. We have ammonia tanks to deal with the leak, oxygen tanks to go on the outside of the airlock, just a little truss segment and some cases. Those are external airlock compartments where gear can be stored and then accessed. The decoupler here, which leads us down into just a little end cap to make it look a little flatter and not show this artwork. I just didn't want to show that. We have some cases. Whoa! We have some cases on the side. A little ring just to act as a spacer. This has been scaled. It's the same as the lander can. But if you look at the lander can, let me take away some of this stuff so it's easier to see. Notice the lander can is much larger. All I did was I made another one by copying the part file and then scaling it down. And you can see here, I called it the Quest Airlock Compartment. So we have our racks, we'll take that off and that. Then we have our racks on the outside. I'm not going to remove those just now. Those racks are for all those big boxes up there. And then this one is for later, we're going to put another external stowage platform on here and that's gonna act as a docking point, so to speak. This whole thing is one welded part. So the top, the middle, and the bottom, that used to be a fuel. Let me get rid of that. That used to be fuel, but I took the fuel out and then welded it together. And this makes the cargo airlock compartment. And then down here we have a common berthing mechanism, a decoupler, and just another probe because the launcher itself, I took the probe out and put this one in to act as extra support. Back in orbit, Bob is now ready to move those boxes over to the Quest airlock, just like you've seen in the vehicle assembly building. So one really interesting thing about a spacewalk is it's not terribly unlike going diving like in the ocean and then rising up again. When they go into their suits, they are only at five PSI and normal air pressure is almost 15 PSI. So what that means is it's kind of the same as if you had been down diving and then you rise up again. Now, if you've ever heard of the bends, well, that's when you get nitrogen bubbles in your blood and it is not fun. Well, I've never had it happen to me. I have been diving, but I've never gotten the bends before. Bob's moving some oxygen tanks over to the side of the compartment right here so that they can repressurize after they have gone on a spacewalk. So I was saying that you can get the bends uh, by doing a spacewalk because inside it's only five PSI in the suits. When you go deep diving, the way that you stop from getting the bends is you have to pause every now and then and come up slowly and then take a break before you actually completely reach the surface and you stay there for a little while. And that allows the nitrogen to resettle and effectively you just, it stops you from getting the bend. Bob needs to move that orbital replacement unit now. And since he wants to take the rack and the box at the exact same time, uh, he's grabbing one and then the other and alternating between them to keep them both going in generally the right direction. When he gets up to the side of the Destiny module, he can dock the, the rack, which uh, is called a fram, and then he'll put the orbital replacement unit on top of that fram, which of course is sitting on that little strut to keep it from sinking into the side of the ship. So I was saying that when you're diving, you have to take breaks on your way back up to prevent getting the bends. Okay, so... In space, it's the same idea because you're going from a higher pressure to a lower pressure, a 15 almost to only 5 PSI, and you have to slowly acclimate into that environment. Well, what they used to do is for a few hours, they would breathe uh, pure oxygen just to get the nitrogen completely out of their blood. And here we're going to take some ammonia tanks up to the P6 truss because we've sprung a leak. But Bob can take care of that. He'll put these on the outside and replenish that ammonia and stop the leak while he's out there. 
Getting back to the spacewalks, one of the things that the Quest airlock provides is it's a nice room where instead of needing to breathe pure oxygen for a little while, the astronauts can actually camp out the night before. So if they're going to go out on an EVA, they can simply sleep in there the night before where they lower the pressure slowly and adjust their atmosphere inside the airlock. And then when they actually wake up the next day and they need to go do their EVA, their body has adjusted. Not only is an EVA very similar to being underwater, but they train for it underwater as well. Buzz Aldrin was a scuba diver, and he thought that training underwater would give them the skills they needed in order to understand how weightlessness of space affected all of your motions, especially inside those bulky suits. You see, he was the first of the Gemini crew that when he went out on his EVA didn't actually get tired. And that would probably be because when you're a scuba diver, you understand that it takes little moves in order to make larger actions, which is very similar to what happens when you're uh, out in space, of course. So Bob here has to finish packing away a few more things that he noticed as he was passing by that robotic arm. He saw some things that he was supposed to have cleaned off last time. So going and grabbing those and putting those away gives us the opportunity now to decouple that orbital injection stage and finally get rid of it. Ha <laughs> ha! And you know what that means. It's on its way back to re-enter the atmosphere and be destroyed by deadly re-entry. Ha ha ha! Say goodbye to the station, Minotaur 1, you orbital injection stage. You will never see it again. Oh, speaking of happiness, or in this case, unhappiness, while Bob here is happy because he's going to get to go and test out that new airlock, Bill has gotten out of anger management, and he hasn't found out yet that we have some orbital debris, but I can only imagine it's a matter of time. It's almost time to take care of the Patrocles. The Patrocles is here on my map. It's working its way up toward Minmus. Minmus is right over there. It looks like it's really far away, of course, because we are going to slow down considerably as we get up here. And as we do, Minmus is going to catch up going right under here, and then we're gonna come back down right on top of it practically. Now the theory behind how the network is working on this one is Patrocles is going to be orbiting around Minmus and scanning it for anomalies, bouncing its signal back over here to the Philippides. Philippides is, if I get this right, not going to be orbiting around Minmus, even though it is intercepting near Minmus right now. It's not supposed to orbit Minmus, it's supposed to continue orbiting around Kerbin. It's going to be on the same semi-major axis as Minmus though, and so that will mean that it'll be lagging just behind Minmus if I do this right and uh, it will stay here behind it and continue being a way for uh, the Patrocles to bounce a signal back to Philippides without ever losing any contact. Now if we go back over here you can see that that signal is then going to bounce back to the Philippides that is currently orbiting in a Molnaya orbit above Kerbin. So it stays most of its time so high above Kerbin that it should generally always be visible. Another thing is because it is a polar orbit satellite, uh, right now, as Minmus is coming by, that polar orbit never goes out of communication relative to the planet because it's going in this direction here. Eventually, as Minmus goes further and further around, that orbit will become uh, out of sight occasionally, but it won't be when we first get there. And that's when we're going to do most of our scanning. So then Philippides will bounce its signal down to maybe one of the Tedris satellites and then back to mission control. And here as we reach our apoapsis, Minmus is zipping up behind us, so we have to switch over to the Philippides, passing through its sphere of influence, and then we will try to circularize our orbit relative to Minmus on the other side. But first, how about if we go take a look at these satellites? Philippides 1 and Philippides 2 are the latest additions to our remote tech network. So hiding down under here, we have a gold foiled protected satellite. It has a couple of radiators up top. We'll get those out of the way to make it easier to see and solar panels. Okay, so working our way up from the bottom, we have some fuel from the, it's either stock or KSPX, I can't remember which, um, 
engine from the AIES mod, a regular Oscar fuel tank, an AIES control pod. We have some lights on the outside, a couple arms with uh, the two servos on it that go into my robotics that let those arms come down and the solar expands. Communications on four sides so that I have future expansion capabilities. I'm using a couple of them right now, but the other two are still not used and I can add to the network then later. We got one light up here, a bunch of batteries on the whole thing so that it can go through the dark side and still be able to communicate. And that leaves us with just a little bit of structure in the middle and that's it. Let's take a look at the other one, the Patrocles. So the Patrocles is our actual scientific satellite. When that one gets to Minmus, we have three instruments that are going to help scan for anomalies. We have that one, that one, and there it is, that one right there. And those all come from the ScanSat mod. And we have a couple little RCS engines, some lights, another AIES engine, Oscar fuel tank, remote tech satellite up top, a little truss segment that it can sit on, a radiator from the interstellar mod. Uh, the solar panels are again on arms. I find that that's the easiest way to get them to expand out to the distances that I want is to put them on robotic arms. So a couple s solar panels there and some extra torque will be provided by these RCS engines on the end. So these antenna, I am pretending that those are helping me do the analysis of the actual anomalies, I do have an additional antenna for real communication. It's got a little tiny bit of monopropellant down inside, whole bunch of batteries just like the other one, and a lot of structure. This is the dipole antenna right here to allow it to communicate uh, without needing to extend the antenna during launch. And then we have that, a little gyroscope, and a pod. Philippides is now circularizing its orbit. What it wants to do is basically be chasing Minmus right behind it the entire time. So it'll always be in the exact same place in the sky all the time. And then we switch back over to the Patrocles that's going to do these scientific experiments and look for those spatial anomalies on Minmus. We are repositioning our orbit so that we are polar and that we can scan the entire surface open our solar panels, get rid of the injection stage. We also don't want any orbital debris even though it is very far away from Kerbin because Bill is adamant about all of it and the last thing we want is to have even more. So we are going to use Minmus here. We will adjust with that orbital injection stage until we have an intercept with Minmus where look, here we go, and there it is now crashing into the surface a few days away. Meanwhile, opening up the radiators and opening up the solar panels on the Philippides communications satellite, which is now trailing behind Minmus, we will be able to bounce our signal back to Kerbin. Even though Kerbal Space Program technically doesn't uh, support this, that communication satellite is sitting in what is called a Lagrange point. It would be uh, L is the letter because Lagrange, right? So they call them L1, L2. Well, it's sitting in what's L5. Oh, there goes another orbital injection stage. We are going to have to deorbit that one, but we're really close to Minmus. We should be able to quickly just throw a little retro burn and that one will be crashing in. There we go. No problem at all. That one's going down to the surface and so we can ignore that one as well. Yeah, so that Lagrange point, our communication satellite will be sitting at L5 while our Patrocles satellite here is deploying all of its scientific instruments to search for those spatial anomalies. We have all these ScanSat instruments that we can deploy here to take a look at everything. Next time on the Gateway Project, we are going to bring up the Piers docking compartment, which was brought up in September 2001 and offered an additional method for going out on an EVA in Orland spacesuit. Until next time, Kerbinauts, I'll see you later.